Pangki semua ayo Hayun dan bara ayo Jual selamanya Ayo Pangki semua ayo Hayun dan bara
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good. May I have your attention please, everyone in the session. Kindly be prepared as the program is about to begin. I also wish to remind all participants to switch off your camera and mute your microphone for those who access from Microsoft Teams. Thank you. To ensure that the session runs smoothly, we have a few advice on the rules of using Teams on video conferencing. Please take a few minutes to understand these rules. Ensure that you are in the correct channel. Ensure videos and microphones are switched off throughout the session. Microphones can be switched on when voice conversation is necessary. And relevant conversation can be posted in the channel. However, please keep it to a minimum to avoid distraction to other participants. If you have any issues relating to Teams, please privately message Mr. Muhammad Harris Latif Muhammad for question and for question and answer. When asking question, please state your name and your campus, followed by your question. You may post your question in the chat box or comment in the UniKL Facebook Live column. Wait until the session is over before leaving the Teams. Thank you. Staff and students. This event is organized by Center for Student Development, specifically the Career and Counseling Support Section. We are also honored that today's session is joined by Yang Bahagia Associate Professor Dr. Tuan Salwani Awang Elias Saleh, Director of Center for Student Development. Welcome to the talk by AP Dr. Muhammad Abdul Rahman, psychiatrist and clinical hypnotherapist from University Kuala Lumpur RCMP, entitled Mindset Preparedness, Adjusting to the New Normal. On behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to thank all participants for being with us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please let me introduce our speaker for today. Our speaker is Dr. Muhammad bin Abdurrahman, Associate Professor in Psychiatry at Faculty of Medicine at University Kuala Lumpur, RCMP. His academic background started in MBBS at Malaya in 1985, continued in Master of Medicine in Psychiatry at UKM in 1993, and then Diploma in Clinical Hypnosis at London College Clinical Hypnosis in 2012. Finally, practitioner in Diploma in Clinical Hypnosis Hypnotherapy at International College of Clinical Hypnosis Practitioners, ICCHP UK 2015. Work experience began as medical doctor with Ministry of Health from 1985 to 1987, and then trainee lecturer at Medical School USM, 1988-1992 and then lecturer and psychiatrist at Hospital USM 1993 to 1996, followed by lecturer and psychiatrist at Medical School Unimas Sarawak 1997 to 1998, continued as private practitioner, consultant and trainer from 1999 to 2008, and finally lecturer and psychiatrist at Medical School University Kuala Lumpur RCMP from 2008 until now. His expertise includes general psychiatrist, hypnotherapist, trainer in mental health, behaviorist, psychotherapist, life coach in mindfulness, and trainer in mental health facilitation. Areas of interest are personal and professional development, stress management, self-hypnosis, mental health facilitation, preventative and intervention psychiatry, and mindfulness training. And current affiliations are Human Excellence Consultancy, Training and Services Enterprise, Fit Unit Enterprise, and Mental Health Facilitation Trainer with NBCC International USA. Without further ado, I would like to invite AP Dr. Muhammad Abdurrahman to start the session. Please welcome. All right, thank you, Sado Haris, for the kind introduction. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera to all the listeners. And I hope uh, this program is uh, running smoothly for this coming one hour or so. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, syukur pada Allah uh, because we have been given this blessing uh, to have this session and to have this sharing. And I hope it will be beneficial for everyone. 
And I think we have been given this topic on uh, mindfulness or uh, mindset preparedness uh, a normal new normal. So first and foremost, it is also a new normal to me now, working from home and working at home with a new environment in that sense. All this while we have been working uh, in the office. So this is a new environment. Uh, we have been uh, so-called, uh, you know, uh, confined into a room, uh, not able to see uh, our audience as much and not able to have eye contact. But otherwise, we can see them uh, in this so-called video conferencing. And the next thing of my new normal will be actually I need to be familiarized with all these technological tools, which I find it sometimes at this age, it's not easy to learn. Uh, as, as you know, you know, it's not easy to teach an old dog new tricks. So it will be, it is quite a struggle for me to be familiarized with these technological tools. And subsequently, my new normal is that now we actually communicate more using video call and video conference. But there are many other new normals that actually we experienced over the last one and a half months or so. So, inshallah, we're getting to get familiar with it. So, with regard to the topic, let uh, let me take you back to what really happens uh, since 18th of uh, uh, March. But actually, the problem started much earlier when it is all about COVID-19 pandemic. So as you know, COVID-19 pandemic has created a lot of unsettled turmoil among all of us globally. Yeah? So the effects that has brought up to everyone when it started in the epicenter in China and then subsequently it become epicenter everywhere else. It has created number one, the effect of fears because COVID-19 is a serious threat uh, to the well-being and life right? on a personal level. It is a very contagious uh, infection. Uh, so we are worried about getting ourselves the infection or contamination. And it is also very virulent. That means it can cause death, especially to the high risk group. Uh, as you know, even like for me and uh, all these, uh, those in the age of 60s with an underlying medical problems and whatnot, will have more risk if we, are, we, if we succumb to this kind of illness. And subsequently, the fears also come in when it also now spread outside China. It goes into almost many countries and now at our own Malaysia national level, we are also worried about the spread which come in very fast. And, and what we worry is the inability to cope with the health threat and our preparedness to handle the issues. As we have seen quite a number of uh, examples in other countries, whereby the uh, spike is so fast, exponential growth is so fast within weeks, and unfortunately the health facilities was not able to handle them, uh, especially for the ICU cases and uh, for that matter reaching to death. Uh, secondly, uh, immediately after we have these so-called fears, uh, our decision was to actually uh, control our movement. So we close our borders, we close our territories, and then we confine people to homes and so obviously so leading to what we call confinement, isolation or in Malay word, I'm, I'm a little bit worried when they use the word kepenjaraan, is as though like we are in, has been jailed in our own home. And so the panic response created what we call imposition of laws and enforcement of laws. Uh, as the laws has been there all this while, but we never have been subjected to this nature before. So now it appears to be that the laws is now being uh, surfacing. So we are into this situation whereby laws are there and we have been uh, confined to home. Uh, in a way, it could be like a curfew, but it is not. It is lesser than a curfew. And the third thing that create the panic response is because of the so-called survival instinct. So all of us, uh, since we can see the effect of this infection or contamination, we can uh, we take note that it is very virulent, it's very contagious, it's very dangerous, and it is fatal. So obviously we want to protect ourselves and we want to protect our significant others. So we immediately actually toe in the line, follow whatever that has been given by the Ministry of Health and by our law ministers and our so-called uh, security ministers and our government. So that is for survival instinct towards self, towards others and towards the citizen of Malaysia. 
Uh, thirdly, we know that there is an effect, the effect of uh, so-called hygiene practices. All this while, we have not really been practicing this as much. And now it is a new norm with regard to using masks, uh, not only just uh, uh, basically a mouth, uh, but covering also the face. So it involves face masks, it involves the mouth masks, and then have to do uh, what we call hand washing, the proper hand washing, because all this while we are taking granted for these hand washing things, and then sanitizing, or, and subsequently the environment need to be disinfected or decontaminated. So, and the effect of number four is basically we know since then, since everything is uh, been confined, uh, so obviously economic uh, shutdown, occupational shutdown for student, uh, vocation, uh, social shutdown, religious restriction and whatnot. And that is because uh, we cannot do the normal routine or what we call the existing or the old norms. So basically, most of the thing that we are experiencing now uh, is uh, the after effect of this so-called fear and this uh, panic response. So the common word now is work from home. So this is the main thing we are experiencing. So basically to manage COVID-19 pandemic, as we can see uh, what have been uh, given, uh, shown by China to start with and all the rest have been following the trends of how to get it done. Uh, so most common, uh, most important thing is imposition. So the authorities has put up regulation, directives and whatnot to impose on people to be able to stay away from getting the infection. And subsequently for the individual, individual must also be able to actually self-regulate because self-regulation is the in thing here. Uh, we may be given directive, but if we don't want to do it ourselves, we don't regulate ourselves, then actually it is the purpose of those directive and preventing ourselves. As you can see, quite a number of communities in uh, globally, uh, some of group which is normal, uh, quite a normal group of people who doesn't want to follow uh, authorities, who doesn't uh, follow rules and regulation, they appear to be going against those and they decided to actually uh, break whatever that uh, has been warranted for them for health reason. And the purpose for this is basically, as I said, human preservation. preservation. Basically, uh, we are worried about, you know, the death toll that goes up by the thousands and in a day itself it can reach into thousands or so. So that is the issue. As you can see in the in the picture, there's a lot more of this uh, confinement in the flats, in the area. Some people have been confined uh, in a very a much better, nicer place, but some has been in very enclosed place whereby this can actually cause the effect of what we call the cabin fever, right? So the effect of the imposition, it can lead into two groups of people, the conformists and the non-conformists. And so this uh, really actually we can see in their attitudes and in their behavior. So the factors that uh, actually could affect these uh, conformists and non-conformists uh, are the actually in terms of the information and the facts that people gather. So some of them uh, did not really trust the information. Some of them think that it was a fake news. So obviously, if you get the proper news, if you get the proper facts, it will be much better for you to actually start to understand what is going on and start to actually appreciate how you can behave accordingly. And also then uh, we notice that uh, there are some issues with regard to perspectives. Uh, some people were looking at it in, in a very different perspective. For example, the religious group, were, were some of them were having a, a different idea about how and why should we uh, confine ourselves and not going to do any of our religious activities anymore and whatnot. So perspective can change uh, in many people's way of looking at things. Uh, but now with the old perspective that we have, we tend to be quite adamant to stay on with the perspective that we believe it was true for ourselves then. And also with regard to the perception, the perception of only certain group of people can get the trouble with this illness. Example, the aged, uh, those with uh, underlying med medical problem. So uh, earlier we, we, we noted that uh, some young, uh, young adults and adolescents, and they were saying that these people will not be getting this kind of illness. So 
now it has changed uh, because uh, by time with time we notice that a lot of new information coming in and people can study cases that was brought in and so the uh, public health sectors uh, public health administrators and whatnot have been able to actually come up with a lot of important statistics and facts. And so does uh, the, the fact uh, whether the imposition comes well with the conformists or not, is about their belief about those kind of a thing. So I guess uh, these are quite an important factors that we need to take consideration uh, because if we want to have a 100% conformist, conformist group of people, uh, we need to handle all these situations. Uh, most important is all about attitude. What is attitude is basically is about how you are feeling or opinion about something or someone or about a way of behaving. So that is important for you to take note because all of us until now we have already have a set attitude with us uh, since young how the attitude is formed as you can see. All right. Uh, attitude is formed when we have repeatedly uh, uh, doing behaviors that at the end of the day reach to a stage of uh, habits and a habit has been going on every day and all the time within years that we have in our life and that has become our attitude. So most important is that can we really change the attitude? Yes, obviously we can uh, in psychological term. To change an attitude is actually to change the behaviors of the individual. Uh, but another important thing beside the attitude is we have to take note about what we call the two level of mind that we have. The conscious mind, which is all the time that we thought we are using it, but actually in our every li everyday life, it is only about 10% of a conscious mind that is active. Uh, but mainly uh, in our 24 hours everyday life, the subconscious mind is much more active than the conscious mind. So we actually tend to be able to, uh, usually we go in and out of this conscious mind to subconscious mind. When we try to do things initially, it is conscious, but subsequently it just went into subconscious mind. And that's when we become mindless about what we are doing. So obviously the subconscious mind, as I said, it governs the belief, it governs the emotion, it governs the values, it governs the habits and whatnot. So actually it's very important for us to look into our subconscious mind more because the subconscious mind tend to make us to become automated and we don't really know what we are doing. We are mindless about what we are doing. But if you want to be mindful, then you are actually putting back yourself into a conscious mind. So the treatment of uh, the handling of actually a lot of problem is either you are in a mindful state or you are in a mindless state. So we need to focus on being a mindful state. A new mindset, obviously a new mindset will come out and reach a new results, right? Because if ever we want to improve ourselves, right? We have to change what we have. So all this while, if we remain at the status quo, we remain the same person all the time, we will, be the same, we will get the same result all the time. But if we want to achieve something, obviously we have to change because we know that without any change, there is no new result coming in. So that's why it's very important for us to dwell into this so-called new mindset. And what is mindset? So mindset is basically a set of beliefs or a way of thinking that determines one's behavior, outlook, and the mental attitude, right? It is about a person's worldview, a person's philosophy of life, and the underlying behind it is about the person's intelligence, the person's talent, the person's uh, uh, ability traits and whatnot that they have with them. And usually uh, it plays a very important role in coping with the life challenges. So all these terminologies need for us to understand first before we can go into the new behavior or the new norms that we are referring to today. And uh, you must also know that there's two group of people, uh, basically uh, with a two, side, uh, two types of mindset. Uh, one group of people has a, what we call a very fixed mindset. Uh, they believe that they can't change anything anymore now. Uh, so they expect things to just go on uh, the same uh, it appears to be like fixed and unchangeable 
and usually these people will rather become very pessimistic uh, they think that the problem is impossible to solve all right uh, but they want to look smart they, they want to be appear to be smart but somehow they are af they are afraid to be judged or being seen by others not to live up to the level of other expectation but the other group which is uh, i think most of us are in this group is what we call the growth mindset whereby they we can develop and strengthen uh, our ways of looking at things doing things committed to doing things and being more hard work so we will face challenges in a very positive manner and we will take up experiences the ups and downs of life uh, as we believe that it is all uh, sake of actually learning and because of learning we'll become better and better so we have to actually develop what we call the growth mindset uh, and trying to actually change those people with a fixed mindset to uh, look into in the other manner of what we call the growth mindset so basically when we look about uh, look into self and community people around us as you know now we already being programmed our behaviors have been learned for all this while many years until now uh, let's say if i'm in now in, in the age of 60 i've i've learned a particular behavior until now and it's very difficult for me actually to change that behavior so learn behavior in this sense is that i have been programmed to be like that in term of doing things way of doing things way of thinking and way of feeling also uh, being programmed uh, to me so anything that uh, actually triggers that uh, uh, having a stimulus giving me the same reaction i will do using the old behaviors but now because of covid-19 pandemic and because of that so called uh, the fatality rate that is high the dangerousness obviously we are having the demand to change in our behavior and to change in the behavior there needs a lot of other factors too but because of that we have to and learn our old behavior so that to undo that old behavior then we can fill up with a new behavior we call it relearn behavior this this concept has been seen in many in many situation even not because of covid alone in everyday life situation they need to be adaptable we need to be interchangeable interchangeable ability to actually be more flexible and uh, you cannot stay on to be rigid because obviously being a rigid person it can cause more distress in you so or to be to do and learn that certain behavior it takes a big task actually i i remember when i started teaching in in 19 uh, in the early 90s uh it's very difficult to actually uh learn new things uh, we were not very familiar with it so uh, subsequently slowly because we willing to learn obviously we can unlearn the old habits so we learn a new new thing easily and once we relearn the new behavior so we become a new person and if the persons are in a group of community obviously the community will become better and subsequently within the community that will end up become a culture So unfortunately sometimes we were trying to put forward some culture in the community in our organization in our group but individually doesn't want to change so they were within they were using their own self uh, but not able to actually fit in very well in the culture that we have in the community so this new normal when we talk about this normal it's not only just the physical health hygiene that we need to actually look into obviously right now we know that uh, we are easily succumb to any kind of infection this so called flu like infection has been there since 1918 uh, plus and uh, until now has been many many uh, occasion where it comes back again and again and there has been like situation whereby in us it's most like every year the flu infection uh, cause a lot of deaths too so uh, but unfortunately all of us has never really uh, been given that uh, training from the very young how to actually prevent ourselves from getting those flu kind of uh, illness uh, example like the face mask example like the social distancing example like the cleaning ourselves once we are out and once we meet up with people and things like that so we have never been uh, given that chance to uh, to practice it because it was not sometimes we don't even uh, so call uh, 
involved in the situation. That's why we, we, we forgot about it. But currently, it's just a wake-up call whereby we have been given this idea that we need to relook at ourselves with regard to our physical health. So obviously, uh, not only this uh, so-called contagious infection that is going on, even the non-communicable diseases and whatnot also for us to actually learn from these new norms uh, with regard to the infection issues. Uh, I think uh, physical health-wise, it seems that now there are many things that we can actually uh, so-called learn from those things. Example, like even uh, not going around as much, uh, you know, so actually that will prevent ourselves from the psychological health, the stress and the distress that we can face while we go out into the society. And on top of that, with regard to the social health hygiene, uh, true enough uh, that we need to actually be around people because uh, any human cannot be uh, individual alone because no human you know can stand on his own because we are interdependent with others but this social health is also very important because at times now uh, we notice that uh, a lot of this uh, group are supporting those frontliners so that indicate that actually we have this this element of self which is within us, very compassionate, very empathetic and whatnot. And on top of that, we also have what we call the new normal with regard to the spiritual health. So about spiritual health, obviously now since there is this so-called danger of death, danger of dying and uh, so we are, most of us are not ready for that. So obviously now we tend to be able to sit quietly, contemplate, reflect in ourselves, and then we are becoming more and more somehow religious in nature. Uh, and truly enough, we actually are not distracted anymore by the outside world as much because we have more time to spend within our home. So those spiritual health kind of a thing is another indication that things uh, give us a reminder that all this while we tend to actually forgot about all this health issues that we have within ourselves, the bio, psycho, social, uh, spiritual nature in our, in our living and in our uh, life domain. Uh, subsequently, when we are outside, obviously when we are working, uh, we have to consider seriously about the occupational and the safety health. And this is part of, uh, of what we are called the health hazard that we have when we are outside working. And also when we are within a group of people, there are some danger, danger situation that we can succumb to. There are some issues of what we call uh, people who are actually uh, not really uh, very well uh, with other communities. They tend to actually hurt others. These are the criminals or the antisocial groups and whatnot. And now these people who are couldn't get uh, attitude where they couldn't be bothered, whether they can spread this uh, illness to others, whether they have this infection or not. So those are the issues that we need to take into consideration with regard to the safety. And subsequently, the environment that we are in, uh, again, we are seeing in, in a lot of uh, the so-called uh, uh, TVs, uh, you know, uh, they were showing how the environment is getting more and more settled and more and more healthy uh, within this uh, so-called COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it is very interesting to take note because now it seems that when humans are too active, too overactive, too much of what we call the current norms that we are saying in, in psychiatry is uh, currently all, all almost all adults are having attention deficit, hyper uh, active uh, behavior. So we have no more attention to particular thing. We are so much in uh, multitasking. We are so much doing so thing, things in our life that we don't really know what we are doing and we can appreciate much that what we are doing. So it seems that this uh, COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic can also actually show that how if we actually uh, tone down our behavior, our activity, and the environmental health goes up very well. So these are the new normal that we need to consider. But the most important thing is a factor determine the acceptance of the new normal. Uh, now we, we notice that uh, most of us are because of what we call in, in psychology, we call it operant conditioning, uh, whereby uh, this uh, learning process has been enforced, has been modified by reinforcement or punishment. Uh, as, as you know, I mean, the, if there is no punishment uh, and no reinforcement, 
we have a tendency to become so relaxed and uh, we don't really look into it seriously. But now because of these so-called laws, uh, regulation and directives, so I think uh, it, 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 it works very well, right? Operant conditioning. But unfortunately, you know that this conditioning, uh, how long will it last? Because uh, if the willingness is not from the person themselves, and, and if the person is out of that environment of this so-called enforced uh, uh, behavior, so the person will go back to the old ways, the old habits, the old attitude. Uh, that's why we are worried if uh, it doesn't come from within, it comes from external. This open conditioning comes from external. So we need to actually develop what we call the acceptance of this new normal is from the willingness to self-regulate. We have to self-regulate our, our behavior, self-regulate our emotions, self-regulate our thoughts, and also self-regulate uh, our life and living. So that is very important. Until Unless we can reach to a stage where everyone is willing to be much better than before. There are four components that everyone needs to understand if they want to be a better person or they want to achieve a, a new norms uh, which is much more profitable and much more better for them. Uh, number one is they must realize that they have problems. If they realize they have problems, only then they will make some changes to themselves. And on top, after realizing the problem, they must accept that they have a problem. Individually, if you don't accept you have a problem, then even though you realize, you won't change. So this is very important uh, phenomenon. So after you realize, then you accept, then after you accept, you will move to actually do something about it. You put yourself that you want to get it better. So again, a lot of person uh, realize they have a problem, they accept that they have a problem, but they did not put a hand to do to solve the problem. So that is the other part. If you don't have these three parts, obviously you will be the same person, uh, same uh, problem that you are say, uh, facing and whatnot. So once you have realization, then you accept what the problem is, then you are really wanting to make the change for that. And the, the fourth one, which is also very important because when you try to do change yourself, it is very difficult because you are just you all this while the way you are. So you need another party to actually to help you out. So that is when you allow yourself to be helped by someone else. So that's why the number four is very important. You allow someone to guide you to make that change. You actually accept that person. You trust that person. And then subsequently you totally submit to that person to make that change and that person will assist you. That person is not imposing on you, but that person work together with you. And on top of that, there is another factor, which is what I call a positive learning. In this case, you must have the interest in what you are learning, and then you must know how you want to learn it and what kind of environment you are in. Uh, obviously, uh, some of us are very unfortunate. We are stuck in a situation whereby uh, we stay in the same old place. Uh, so the environment might not be as much as conducive. We did not get out of that situation. For like example, like, you know, there's no new learning. Uh, like our old phrase was saying, uh, you know, the kata di bawah tempurung kind of a thing. So obviously we cannot see the new world. We cannot uh, experience new things. So we must have the positive learning environment, positive learning attitude, and positive learning emotion. Uh, the other thing, uh, the factors is with regard to motivation. Who can create that motivation? Obviously, if you create the motivation yourself, that is called self-motivation. Self-motivation is much better than just being motivated by others because, again, as I said, others can try. We can bring 10 experts in front of you to try to change your behavior to be better for the new normal. Unfortunately, if you are not willing to do that, there's no such thing as self-motivation within you, the 10 experts effort will go to waste. That's why we are seeing in, 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 in our so-called students that we are teaching, sometimes we are, we are so frustrated because 
we thought we motivate them, we thought we show them the way, but uh, unfortunately that within themselves, that self-motivation, wanting to be better, want to change and whatnot, is basically the hindrance. And subsequently, each and every one of us must have what we call the sense of purpose. In our life, if we don't have a sense of purpose, obviously we are just drifting away, we don't know what is going on. So the new norms, actually, you must equip them. What is your sense of purpose now with regard to the new norms that uh, is being uh, coming in to you or being imposed to you or being self-imposed by you? So without the sense of purpose, obviously there is no such thing as what we call sense of belonging. No sense of belonging means you don't really feel that you need to do that. There are times we see a lot of people at the end of the day, uh, they don't feel it is personalized to them. People have been saying a lot of things, people are trying to show a lot of things to them, but because they don't take that personally to themselves or they did not actually turn it inward for them to make the change, so they don't actually appreciate what was actually right in front of them. This is what we call, sometimes people don't realize the opportunity is there, right? And unfortunately, the opportunity comes and goes and they did not take it up very well. So these are the factors eh, that determine. Uh, subsequently, as I said, there are the other determinants. Uh, most important is with regard to personality. And with regard to personality, I would like to to actually share with you all. All of us actually, uh, after the age of 20 or so, we have what we call a well ingrained, settled uh, personality that we are actually showing to a lot of people. And this personality uh, comes out due to the traits that we are using quite uh, uh, commonly all the time. And that become our character. So. Unfortunately, people were saying that it's very difficult to change a personality. So once it is settled and ingrained, the personality is with us. But actually, it is not to change the personality because if you go back to the same old environment, you will bring along that personality. But if you're in a new environment, you can redefine your personality. So example, I give an example. If I'm a lazy person, but now I'm a doctor, obviously when I take up uh, the profession and I, when I wear the coat, when I put my stethoscope, when I go to the ward, I cannot be lazy anymore. So on top of that, even though I have a tendency to be lazy, I will switch the other side of the coin to be a hardworking person, to be a committed person in doing my uh, profession. So that's how you can redefine your personality. And interestingly about personality is that you, as I said, if you can change your attitude, actually you can change your character, you can change your personality and it takes uh, later in the slide I will again emphasize, it takes actually uh, to change habit more than three months of doing the new habit again and again every day well in your disciplines doing it uh, really seriously wanting to do it only then it can change that old habit and it can make a new attitude and at the end of the day, you can be seen to have a new personality. The other determinant is your level of education. So obviously it's very important, uh, but we, we take note also that uh, level of education, even though there are a lot of, you know, clever people around, sometimes their personality is the one that bring them down, right? Some, uh, we're quite surprised, some of uh, very in so-called intellectual, academically achieved person, uh, but the personality was the one who actually uh, brings them not to behave accordingly to what we thought they should be. Uh, so education alone does not mean anything. Uh, that's why it's very important to couple the personality and the education. And thirdly, I think uh, with regard to the new norms, uh, since uh, we are uh, quite in a way confined, uh, so we have to actually add on our uh, skills and one of the skills is technology literacy and technology savvy and accessible resources. So not everyone is fortunate enough to be able to have all these, but uh, government wise, I believe if government uh, can actually uh, prepare all these for every individual citizen that we have, then actually that will bring up all of us 
to a certain level of being a so-called uh, very healthy citizens. And on top of that, some people have trouble with uh, economic, with uh, the social status. So these are also another determin determinant uh, for us with regard to maintaining the uh, social uh, new behavior. Uh, yes, you can see uh, some of us are hard up with uh, surviving. Some of us uh, are not able to actually uh, live up to a certain uh, level of expectation and certain level of challenges. So we need to actually help these people out. That's why, as I said, as an ummah or as a community, we need to be very compassionate and we need to have sympathy and empathy towards each and every one of us. So it started with home. And uh, since uh, it started with home, now we are very, we actually, we can see more of what is happening at home with our spouse, uh, with our children and things like that. So subsequently we can appreciate them much better. And later then we can move out to appreciate people around us. And the other determinants are age, uh, some young, some old. Uh, so I guess uh, age is very important because age means wisdom. Hopefully with uh, maturity comes with age, uh, wisdom comes with age. But again, some people, if they stay in the same old self, then age does not mean anything to them. And I believe gender also in terms of emotional sensitivity, in terms of uh, inclinations and whatnot. So gender also can play a very important role as a determinant for this so-called new normal. And at the end of the day, it's all about our values and our virtues. What kind of person that we are, what kind of uh, philosophy, uh, life philosophy that we have, and what values that we uh, carry around. So as long as all of us have what we call the universal values of uh, at being peace, uh, being uh, happy and uh, able to actually look after each other, I think that will uh, cover these uh, so-called changes that we want to. So uh, did you buy the idea of a new norm? I think the idea of a new norm can only be bought very well or can only be ingrained very well with reinforcement and punishment. So with that, it can be highly likely developed. But again, as I said, a lot of people are not happy with that situation where we have what we call uh, especially negative reinforcement. If it is positive reinforcement, that will be good. That is called appreciation. Uh, but a lot of people are not also happy if they are just all this while being negatively reinforced. Whatever good they do will never be taken into consideration, but whatever bad that they do will be punished and whatnot. But this is actually uh, one of the important factors that start people to move to a new behavior or new normal. So without this so-called reinforcement and punishment, uh, people will take it very lightly and especially those with a uh, very indifferent attitude will not even look at it uh, even though we try to push the idea to them. So, but the second part, I think uh, beside that, it is very important. We must have what we call our own sense of needs and purpose for betterment. And this is much, much better than uh, negative reinforcement or punishment. So with his own sense of needs and purpose for betterment, highly it will continue as a new behavior. So from now on, we better relook at ourselves. What is our purpose in life? Uh, as you know, uh, people have been talking about our enemy, we can't even see the enemy, but the threat is so real and we don't know how to handle the threat. So we must be able to look at how vulnerable we are, how weak we are uh, with regard to just this simple virus uh, which can mutate and we turn to be more and more virulent, which change their forms uh, in, 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 in a quick manner and things like that. We are already losing the battle. So I think uh, we need to look at our sense of needs and purpose in life and living because until unless we look into that, we are going to be a person who's always easily succumb to any kind of challenges of this nature or any kind of challenges anywhere that we are, we are seeing in the world. And uh, to do those things is not only at individual level, obviously individual level, we must have that, but we need group because a behavior, it needs to be enforced, it needs to be 
uh, in, in terms of behavior management, behavior based management, we can't do the management alone because we are already not having the proper behavior. So because of that, we need a group to actually supervise us, a group to encourage us, a group to support us. So without the group, then that new behavior will extinct very fast. I can tell you uh, once this uh, MCO is over and then we tend to forget about what we have experienced. So we will go back to the old self. But unless everyone is now behaving in, with the new norms, uh, so inshallah, I think uh, it will later develop into what we call a new culture within us. The new health culture uh, in terms of physical health, social health, psychological health, uh, spiritual health, environmental health and whatnot. So the new behavior must be practiced every day for at least three months to achieve adaptation. So remember this, uh, we are just into our so-called second months and once everything is being lifted off, I believe we may revert back to our old self. So the new behavior might be a thing of a past in a very, in a very near future. So this is very important for us to take note. And, uh, it is important to start with that it takes like 21 days to, to practice a new habit and then it takes about three months to really adapt and to actually use that habit uh, to become a new norm for you. So, and to ensure continuous practice, individual group needs appreciation and encouragement. So, most of us, if we are alone, we have a tendency to actually uh, our motivation dies down, but if the motivation is uh, is is uh, uh, flame up all the time with people around us, encouraging us to be better, encouraging us to be in the group doing the same thing, which is for the betterment of everyone, I guess that will maintain these so-called new norms to a new level of our life and living. So basically, uh, to adopt uh, this new behavior, the success is that individual may face more difficulty in sustaining the behavior as behavior based management needs support by others around us so the keyword is behavior transformation as we can say before we talk about anjakan uh, paradigma minda now we talk about behavior uh, transformation too so with our thought uh, transformation, with our cognitive uh, restructuring, with our behavior uh, improvement and behavior uh, transformation, I believe that this new norm will not be any more a difficult situation for us and we can be a better group of community. So with that, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I would like to actually open it up for uh, discussion and for question answer session. So I pass it back to Saudara Haris. Saudara Haris, I can't hear you. Okay, hi. Okay. okay. Thank you, Doctor, for the very interesting talk. Um, okay, so let's begin with the question and answer session. Yeah. Okay, it seems that we have one question from Get, which it, and he says, you said that it will take around three months to change one's attitude and behavior. So how do how to achieve consi consistency in doing something new? It is very difficult. So can you give some tips? Yeah, uh, basically it's about uh, remembering what you really want in your everyday life, the purpose of your everyday life. Example, like if you did not plan your day, if you do not think about what you really want to achieve, you know, if you if you look at uh, this concept of uh, begin with the end in mind every day, uh, you know, Stephen Covey has been saying that in his book. So if you don't have any plan, if you don't have any uh, idea of what the outcome you want to be in that day, obviously then you will tend to be distracted with so many other things. So to maintain certain behavior right now, uh, very interestingly, it appears to be like, I believe quite a number of us are more and more uh, into religious practice while at home, uh, because uh, I think the, the situation has, uh, has keep, up, uh, keep us up to be more fully aware of that. So that is most important. So 
basically the more uh, the idea is that be mindful of your life and living every day and mindfulness talk about at present if you are not mindful at present now when you wake up what you really want to do and then you you did not plan anything you did not strategize yourself did, did not organize yourself so at the end of the day after yeah, just i can tell you after half an hour one hour later you are not sure actually what you are doing so the idea is to put those things either in writing in a way that you can always see and remember it what is the reason and the purpose that you are going to achieve for that day so example like uh, today if you said i want to be more diligent in my study so to be more diligent then you better uh, when upon waking up or even before you you sleep you already uh, put your dua and you already actually uh, put your mind your mind frame into that situation whereby it's all about tomorrow my main goal is with regard to my study and how i'm going to actually focus on the study and how i'm going to do so you can actually prepare the uh, the strategy the organization the planning even prior to waking up and then uh, with regard to uh, the practice of self hypnosis even uh, bef uh, before you go to sleep actually you can put yourself to sleep by using self hypnosis and self hypnosis talk about your subconscious mind uh, basically you program your subconscious mind to be able to do things even though you did not realize it anymore and so if you did uh, if you continue doing self hypnosis before you sleep and in the self hypnosis you give suggestion what you want to do the next day you'll be surprised right if you self hypnotize uh, to sleep and you say that you want to wake up at let's say 5 o'clock in the morning for your prayer and for other things to be prepared for the day your body will just uh, wake up uh, accordingly to that because you actually prime your subconscious mind so this is another way of doing it so in fact the night before you are already ready so you are a person who is very mindful all the time and definition of mindfulness is that every moment is a very important moment and you are living in your present so if you can remember that presence then you will not actually waste that present because future all depend on the present right if your present is right every step you make is right then the future will be right right so in this uh, situation some of us like to dwell in the past so past it's supposed to be what we can learn from right become so called our examples and things like that for us to take forward but if we stay in the past then obviously we are going to get stuck and we are not improving so i believe there are many methods to do it but i think uh, if i can uh, actually uh, help you to understand the concept of being mindful help you to understand the concept of uh, uh, what you say outcome based person help you to be in the concept of uh, knowing how your subconscious mind works then that will be the way to handle the problem and the, the thing the other thing is that you have to have a partner sometimes we forgot that uh, to do to behave uh, whatever that new behavior to be better someone need to tell us someone need to remind us someone need to actually assist us if ever we actually got derailed if ever we got misstep someone will able to tell us that we have actually misstep and so put back into the proper trail so that is very important so that's why i said the the four component of realization acceptance then do wanting to do something about it and allow people to assist us uh, we can then submit to the person's uh, ability especially the person is much better than us so i think the success will be better so it takes 3 months obviously but i guess uh, you have to put that into your so to to put it inside you so to put it inside you to internal internalize it so it cannot be only a one uh, one off situation okay does thank that answer you. the question uh, thank you doctor okay uh, another question is uh, that from nur nadira Uh, it says that some of the students are still in self isolation at hostel or at rented house near the hostel so they may not be able to celebrate raya with their family so can you give them a few words on how they can manage their feelings and emotions during this time yeah 
It's very, it's very in interesting phenomena now. Uh, I guess uh, not only them will face the same problem. I mean, for us also, we might not be able to even meet up our own family back in, in our kampung and whatnot. So I think everyone is in the same boat. But most important is that uh, sometimes we have to actually look at the priority. Uh, if we have got really this kind of obstacle whereby we cannot move around as much, we cannot uh, meet up with people for the time being. So we have to learn how to actually be more adaptable. And remember, humans are very adaptable. So uh, you'll be surprised. Uh, actually, this kind of issues has been going on even before this COVID-19 issues. Uh, a lot of our kids, our children, our, you know, uh, our, when we were young too, uh, some of us were sent overseas to study and whatnot. So by then they already actually lost their so-called social network back home and things like that. But they learn how to live together among them. Uh, they learn how to survive within uh, their group. So I think, again, not only just adaptable, flexible, but also should have a positive outlook with regard to, well, it might not be now, but it can be later. So hopefully there will be time for us to get back to where we can meet up with friends, with family uh, from this so-called isolation. Uh, so unfortunately, the, the main problem with uh, every human being is this issue of immediate gratification. We want things fast. We want to be satisfied fast. We want as though as that there should not be anything that can obstruct us. And that is one of the key where people become stressed and distressed. And that is one of the key where mental disorders come about, where psychological distress come about. Because we cannot be challenged, we cannot, I mean, if we understand religiously, uh, spiritually, we know this is a test from Allah. So obviously, if it is a test, we have to accept with good heart, with good faith, uh, with uh, with a lot of patience. So th that's why it's, it's very important right now. This is a good uh, uh, situation whereby all of us, uh, actually us to relook at our spiritual being, our spiritual uh, domain in ourselves. How are we when Allah wants to test us with all these kind of difficulties, how we react to those tests? And I believe if we are very strong in our spiritual being, spiritual being governs psychological being. Psychological beings and spiritual being governs our physical being. So whatever environment we are in, it doesn't touch us because the person himself or herself is too strong enough to be shaken by anything. So that is very important for us to understand. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Eco-Friendly Club. It asks, what kind of activity could be suggested to promote social health for a single or small family unit? Most important right now, uh, again, uh, as a family unit, we have to actually socialize as a family. Uh, you'd be surprised the new norm that all of us have even before COVID-19 is that we are a family, but we are individual. Uh, we have we have house, but we don't have home. We have family, but we don't have relationship kind of a thing. So I think to start with, if possible, this is the best time to get to know each and every member of the family. Uh, but if you are a single person, obviously uh, you have to find uh, some other person to communicate with because you cannot be alone as, as what we call an introvert person who prefers to be alone, a uh, socially avoiding person, personality uh, who doesn't want to have friends. And those are all those uh, a, a problem, uh, psychological problem cases. But I believe all of us have to live with people around us. And to live with people around us, we have to open communication channel. We have to be able to actually get to know people around us. So as much as possible, if you're alone right now, contact all those 
Uh, now you can actually uh, either using video call, you can phone them, you can Skype with them, you can always, uh, even though they are far, but you can see the faces right now, I can see your face, even though I cannot really sense that emotion, that aura, you and me kind of a thing. But at least I can see your smile, I can see your you know body language kind of a thing. That helps actually. Uh, so it, it's very important to open the channel of communication. Okay, let's see if we have. Okay, uh, there's a question from Facebook. Um, it says that the MCO, okay, the MCO has taken a lot from our normal life. I am not able to see my friends and at times I feel very anxious. Do I need to reach out to a counsellor or should I wait and see what happens? Do you think I should deal with the anxiety feeling as early as possible? All right, thank you for the question. Very interesting question, very important question. With regard to being anxious, alone, uh, not able to meet up friends, I mean, uh, actually uh, socializing is our way of coping. Uh, it is an escape route for us. Sometimes when we are alone, we don't know what to do, but we can escape with uh, within the vicinity of our friend, our people, our uh, groups that we have and then we can distract ourselves from our own problem. So that's why uh, as a social person, as a social so-called being, we need to be with friends. So the only thing is that always remember these are just temporary. These are just brief in nature. Whatever it is, you'll be surprised. Uh, some other community even experience worse than this. For example, there's been, uh, in a way, being confined to uh, a specific area, being not given to move around as much in certain community. Uh, so they are even worse than us that we are facing right now. But with regard to your anxiety, obviously, uh, it's very important to open up. So uh, you don't need to wait until the thing burdens you so much. It's like actually uh, you, whether you realize it or not, whether all of us realize it or not, our life and living, we have been carrying actually a pail on top of our head or over our shoulder since young. Uh, and the pail is uh, actually, you be uh, some of us doesn't have a nice uh, so-called uh, filter mechanism and the pail is open so much that almost any rubbish will come in and can, can be thrown inside the pail and it burdens us if the pail is peeled up. So if we have a pail of that nature, we don't have any filter mechanism, we don't know what to choose, what to take in, what not to take in, we feel that we are very stressed and tense because uh, we are feel, uh, feeling so uh, difficult with the situation that we are in. Most important is please start to bore a hole and make a tap at the bottom of the pail and so let the water or let the rubbish or let whatever that comes into our mind to flow out. And in that situation, then you talk to someone, you call up, you talk to, uh, you can talk to a counselor, you can talk to your family, you can talk to your best friend because you are not completely confined in isolation that you cannot even communicate with anyone. Uh, this situation is happening, uh, especially for those who suddenly been confined in a, a death life row sentence kind of a thing. You know, they did not able to communicate. They were put and, and housed only in one small isolation room. That's why they have these kind of so-called uh, issues that crops up within them. Uh, that's when that's, uh, when they are actually in a close situation of that nature. They can even hear voices when there is none. Uh, they call it hallucination. So we don't let those things happen. We don't allow those things to happen because this situation is not as much that worse as what we what I have been mentioning. So basically, communicate with friends. Uh, call up. If you feel that you need uh, to get counsel, why not? But most important about counseling is that the counselee the person themselves must want to be counsel for a betterment. If the person doesn't want to be a counsel for the betterment, if I were just to actually advise and those kind of a thing, so the counsel doesn't work because that person doesn't want to, to make that change or to want to be better. So for this uh, for this group, I believe, uh, just, just start opening the channel because I think you have a communication tool, you have your phone, uh, you can actually somehow uh, communicate with the rest. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, it seems that uh, there are no more questions. So again, thank you, Dr. AP Dr. Muhammad Abdul Rahman, for the kind responses. And we will okay. now come to the end of the program. But All right. Before we end, uh, I would like to thank everyone for us this session. Till we meet again, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you and have a pleasant day and stay safe. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.